Hello, I'm Ellie Dantman, president of the American Heart Association. We're here in sunny San Diego at the 64th annual scientific sessions of the American College of Cardiology. I'm so pleased to be joined by Dr. Robert Bono, our past president of the American Heart Association, and Dr. Mark Krieger, uh, president-elect of the American Heart Association. Uh, we had late-breaking clinical trial session one, and Bob, you were the chair of the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Board for the PROMISE trial. You want to describe a little bit about what that uh, study was investigating? This was an important trial, uh, Elliot. It's really kind of a, new, a whole new concept of doing a comparative effectiveness trial with imaging. It was funded mm -hmm. by the NHLBI, so I think we have, we have our tax dollars to thank for a really well-done trial comparing a CT angiography versus a functional exercise or stress test in patients with new onset chest pain, stable disease, uh, where the guidelines would indicate that imaging is appropriate uh, to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the first time we've had a head head comparison of CTA versus um, uh, functional stress testing. And it was, po it was powered to try to determine whether there actually could be a better outcome in terms of uh, heart events. That was a negative trial in terms of the heart events, but there were some very interesting insights regarding what doctors do with information and perhaps how the, how the patients behave having had these tests done. So there was a composite endpoint of lots of bad things you'd never want to have happen to a patient. And they, were, uh, they occurred with equal frequency uh, in the two treatment arms. Tell us about the radiation exposure. That was an interesting question here. Exactly. So, well, some patients got randomized to receive the CTA. Other patients then were, were randomized to a, a stress test, which could either be a nuclear test or a stress echo or just a stress EKG. The patients who got the stress nuclear test had higher radiation than the CTA, but across the board, CTA gave more radiation than a stress EKG or stress echo, as you would imagine. So there is a radiation issue here. Um, I think more importantly was that the CTA delivered positive results in that in patients who, based upon the test, went to angiography. The angiography more often resulted in a uh, finding of a of real coronary disease, mm -hmm. whereas the patients who had the functional tests many times had a coronary angiogram that was uh, negative with normal coronaries. So there was a little bit more positive spin in terms of the diagnostic accuracy of this, of this uh, procedure. And tomorrow we'll see another uh, late-breaking clinical trial from Scotland also looking at the role of CTA versus functional imaging. So in, in uh, this meeting we'll have two trials of uh, looking at the role of CTA. Surely needed information. Um, Mark, when I looked at the uh, results of the PROMISE study, I was very impressed with how well medical therapy did. The uh, investigators postulated there'd be an 8% event rate in the functional testing arm, but it was only 3%, and it was essentially the same, as, as Bob points out. What does that you know, teach us about the importance of medical therapy here? Well, actually, it affirms that we're doing a reasonably good job in keeping patients who have known coronary artery disease out of trouble, mm -hmm. right? We're using antiplatelet drugs. We're using statin therapies. And as a consequence of that, the overall event rates are diminishing. And uh, we saw that in the uh, PROMISE trial, where there's only a three, approximately 3% event rate in mm -hmm. each arm during the course of the trial. And I think that explains why the results were uh, yeah. somewhat negative in yeah. terms well, of it's one good test being better than another. Good news for patients, which is if they take the prescribed medications, they're actually going to do quite well. Now, there was a second trial in the late-breaking clinical trial session. This looked at stable ischemic heart disease patients and evaluated uh, a P2Y12 inhibitor ticagrelor. And I think the, the bottom line of that study was it adds to the body of evidence that antiplatelet therapy is useful for preventing events in patients with atherosclerotic vascular disease, especially when it's given over the long term. How's that, what's the mechanism by which that might be happening, Mark? Well, this trial does confirm the concept that antiplatelet therapy, the more you give, the better the outcome. So in, with dual antiplatelet therapy here, aspirin plus ticagrelor, there was a reduction in cardiovascular events, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Reminiscent, if you will, of what we saw in the Charisma trial when looking at the group of patients who had prior myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. Now the mechanism presumptively is inhibition of thrombus superimposition over atherosclerotic plaque. And that, of course, is the mechanism most likely to uh, 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 develop and result in uh, myocardial infarction. So having more antiplatelet therapy probably reduces the development of thrombus over the plaque and reduces the risk of events. 
It wasn't studied in, in the Pegasus trial, which is the study of the uh, ticagrelor agent, but uh, do you use uh, combination antiplatelet therapy in patients with peripheral vascular disease? Well, peripheral vascular disease, and specifically peripheral artery disease, is a very important manifestation of atherosclerosis, and these patients often have systemic atherosclerosis with coronary artery disease or cerebral vascular disease in addition to peripheral mm -hmm. artery disease. And in, in studies such as Charisma, not looked at yet in Pegasus, but there are ongoing trials, including Euclid, uh, which is looking at Ticagrelor, uh, we'll be testing that hypothesis. And uh, it it's, has the potential, but has not yet been shown, that dual antiplatelet therapy would be effective in reducing atherosclerotic events in that population as well. well I think th th the importance here is, I think, not only for the patients in this trial who are, all have had a prior myocardial infarction, but I think many clinicians may extrapolate this now to be giving dual antiplatelet therapy for all of their patients with documented coronary artery disease. Interesting that's point. It's going beyond where we know with the, gut, with the uh, trial, but I think that's probably where we're heading. Could be. And now, these are the trials that we've heard about so far this morning. Uh, but there's a whole host of other trials that deal with a new way of dealing with elevated cholesterol. And we use the shorthand nomenclature PCSK9 inhibition. So I'm going to ask Dr. Krieger here to explain what PCSK9 is first, and then Bob's going to tell us what the implications are of all this. So all what's right. PCSK9? So PCSK9 is a protein uh, synthesized by the liver. Uh, those initials actually mean something. They stand for pre-protein convertase subtacillin kexin type 9. And what that protein does... Well done, Mark. <laughs> thank you. ...is internalize the hepatic LDL receptors, mm -hmm. uh, and after uh, internalization, they become degraded. And therefore, there's less LDL receptors on the liver, and then less uh, absorption of LDL from the blood, making it available to go to the blood vessels where it contributes to the formation of atherosclerotic plaque. Okay, so a lot of PCSK9 is bad, Correct. because it means your LDL level is going to be high in your blood. And if we had a situation where the PCSK9, PCSK9 levels were low, that might lower LDL. So we have an, an AHA-funded investigator who put a lot of this on the map, uh, Dr. Helen Hobbs. And Bob, exactly. what did she find? Well, she's found that there are individuals who have a genetic defect which, where they have very low levels of this enzyme. And those people have not only very low LDL levels, but very few events. And so this has now led to lots of excitement uh, among investigators and clinicians and industry to develop drug to target this particular agent. Right now, they're antibodies that have to be injected subcutaneously, um, but showing very striking reductions in LDL cholesterol over the course of time. And uh, we're going to see some data this week, perhaps also showing a reduction, uh, whether or not this leads to a reduction in events. Okay, so uh, we're not dealing with a pill here. We're dealing with a subcutaneous injection, usually into the wall of the abdomen, every two weeks or every four weeks, much like a diabetic patient might give themselves injections of insulin or individuals who take subcutaneous injections for DVT, mm -hmm. for example, with uh, enoxeprine. So we learned uh, in the past that these drugs are capable of lowering LDL, very dramatic lowering of LDL. I have one last question for the two of you, which is we might be seeing LDL levels well below 50. Now that's more than we can achieve with the very highest tolerated dose of statins and some non-statin therapy on top of that. So Mark, if we're looking at an LDL less than 50, what kind of era would, could we be seeing in the future for vascular disease? Well, hopefully we'll see the end of vascular disease. Uh, but most likely we'll see a substantial reduction in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And uh, as a consequence of that, less stroke, less heart attack, less peripheral artery disease, less cardiovascular death. And I think that would be an outstanding outcome that for drugs such as this. very good news. And Bob, that's going to take us a long way down the road towards our 2020 impact goal. It is. We have a ways to go to get there. But the, the, drugs like this and science like this is really leading the way toward that goal. So that's uh, the first day here at the ACC. Lots of exciting information. Stay tuned for AHA Science News. This is Dr. Elliot Antman with Dr. Mark Krieger and Dr. Bob Bono.